Yeah. I know <clears throat> worshiping with kids around can be distracting sometimes. But take it to a lesson. That's how we learn to worship in the midst of distractions. <laughs> because that's what happens in life, right? Uh, it's not like in life we can, okay, suffering, pause, I will worship God, right? But you worship God in the midst of all that's going on. So I'm not saying that we just don't do anything, but hey, uh, there's always something that we can learn in the midst of that. Um, a few time ago, <clears throat> I was attending a wedding. And the groom, when it's time to say thanks to the parents, and that's the, 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 the habit here in, in Indonesia, um, I am struck by what he said about his mom and dad. I'm trying to find my notes. And basically, this is what he said. Mom and dad, I know that you are not the richest parents. I know that when we grow up, we don't have a lot. And when he said that, I paused like, whoa. <laughs> is, this, uh, is, this, is, the, is the groom trying to kind of, quote-unquote, bring down his parents in his wedding date, you know? <laughs> like, well, what's going on? He's just trying to kind of open the sore part about his family. But I'm sure he had the best of intentions, okay? But that's just me. I'm just cynic that way. Whoa, what's going on? Why did he say that? But then he continues. He said, Mom and Dad, I know that you are not the richest parents. I know that we don't have a lot when we grow up. But I just want to thank both of you that today I'm here, that you have taught me how to love God and how to serve God. That's, that's uh, when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's, that's awesome, you know. And, 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 and I, because I know the family, the family is not uh, doing well as well relationally. There's been a uh, brokenness in the family, and as you hear from what he said, uh, that even, 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 even in the midst of all of that, he said, thank you guys for teaching me to love God and to serve the Lord. That story, real story by the way, reminds me that what amazing grace that God has. It's like this, even if we mess up, God can still make our next generation turn out okay, right? Like, I'm not saying that we have to, you know, just do whatever. No, I'm not saying that. But how many of you have seen mom and dad broken, failures, just totally bad parents overall, but then you have wonderful, wonderful kids. Pernah lihat gak? Yeah. Papa mamanya jahat lah, gampangnya gitu. Tapi anak-anaknya bisa baik banget. Oh, you saw you. <laughs> and you ask, what's the recipe? You know? But that's, that's the grace of God. It's like, uh, I'm, it's like the joy of, of making other people, of shaping other people by the grace of God. And even when we fail, even when we fall short, God can continue to shape the next generation. God can continue to shape other people according to His will. The text today is talking about that. The text today, for, uh, I believe by God's grace, is talking about transition. The balance between the old generation and the new generation. That we have an amazing God that continues to sustain us throughout generations. Sometimes, as the old generations, we do good or we do bad. What's important is God is calling us to continue making disciples, continue to shape other people, the next generation, to follow and to serve Jesus. As we've seen in the past two months, we've been talking about uh, mission and also the Great Commission. Now, in October and November, we will look at specifically how discipleship looks like. 
That's why the title of today's sermon is Discipleship Model Moses. And then in the next uh, Sundays, we'll be talking about, uh, I think, Elijah and then John or Jesus. We will, you know, basically just to show all of us how does this look like. Okay? Uh, so with that, uh, I would like for us to go to um, uh, Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 to 16. Uh, Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 to 16. And uh, if you can open your Bibles, uh, that will be great. I'm reading from uh, the ESV. I apologize, I don't have the whole text here. I just have a, I've broken down the text in uh, sermon sections. So if you would uh, be patient with me, I'll just be reading from the Bible, not from the slide, yeah? So, Exodus 17, 8 to 16, the title that's been given here in the, in, in the Old Testament is Israel Defeats Amalek. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Revedim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur, 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 uh, how, how do I pronounce that? Hur? Not sure, Hur? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm sure he's going to be okay. You can ask him later. Um, went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. And I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Let's pray one more time before we go to God's word. Lord, we come before you. Thank you for your word. Help us to understand, to enjoy, to reflect, to chew on it, and to humble our hearts, open our lives to be shaped by your wonderful revelation. Father, we need you. Please speak to us, speak to our conditions, and help us to obey you and to find Jesus Christ and the gospel through the text this morning. Help me, Father. I am a weak and sinful preacher. Equip me, sustain me, guide me as I speak to your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, today we will look at a discipleship model and the context is about leadership transition. Now, I know, disclaimer, I did not choose the text today. <laughs> oh, just what happened last Sunday uh, with the announcement of the transition, I don't know why this is it, honestly. Because uh, we, our, our, the whole sermon and the topics has been uh, prepared for us since last year, okay? So, Disclaimer ya, Bapak Ibu yang hadir minggu lalu, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, today's text is out of my, yeah, and, and, and we as pastors, we have discussion about the text, and apparently this is where we want to go, okay? So, with that, let's, let's begin. Um, Israel was out of Egypt, and now f- is facing multiple dangers, okay? They face starvation, and then God provided manna. They faced dying from thirst, and then God brought water from the rock. It's like miracles after miracles of God's and His amazing acts. And then finally now, they are facing enemy attack. Now you would imagine it's going to be another miracle stories. You're right, but it's a bit different. So let's go to the setting, to the setting of the story. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Notice, we have no reason why Amalek 
attack Israel. Okay? No indications that the Israelites provoked the attack. I mean, they're just passing through. Ngapain? Cari gara-gara. They're not looking for troubles. Right? Now, from other uh, texts, we have some hints that, for, in, for instance, in Deuteronomy 25, 18, it states the Amalekites did not fear God. Uh, and Amalek, by the way, was Esau's grandson. So they are distant relatives of the Israelites. But as far as we can tell, uh, the Amalek, Amalekites, they lived by attacking other people and plundering their wealth. So they are the ancient pirate, you know. Uh, so they are the Amalek, Amalek pirate, so to speak. It's just what they do, you know, because they did not fear God. Or maybe this is just a case of turf war. You know, the Israelites are coming into their territories. They got threatened and they just, hey, before they do anything to us, let's just, you know, bring the battle to them, so to speak. Anyway, uh, what I want to say is this, that this war or battle, meaning Israel is on self-defense, okay? They are not attacking. They are being attacked, so they got to defend themselves. This is not those genocide story like in Joshua this is Israel defending themselves against enemy attack. So what's going on? What happened? Instruction. Um, this is what it is. Moses then said to Joshua. Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men, go out and fight. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. This story is significant because Joshua appears here for the first time. Now we know later Joshua will formally replace Moses as the leader, right? But here we have indication that Moses is preparing to train Joshua to take over. Why do I say that? Well, remember I said in the beginning that all the while it's been miracles after miracles after miracles. And here in verse 9, Moses, without explicitly consulting God, or maybe he has, the Bible just didn't say, he said to Joshua, Josh, go. You go to war. And Joshua was much younger than the 80-year-old Moses at that time. Joshua was referred as his young assistant. Kalau bahasa Indonesia itu abdi, gitu ya. And which suggests he was the right-hand man of Moses in various ways. Though at this point, what Moses needs from Joshua is his ability to lead into battle. Now, just to clarify, when the text says, choose for us men, it's not like Joshua had a choice between Navy SEALs, Army, and the Mossad, you know. <laughs> it's not like he has a battle-ready troops, okay? Come on, these guys are refugees. They, are, they, they were just out of Egypt. I'm pretty sure they were not out from Egypt carrying snipers and machine guns, okay? They'll be carrying some pots and pans and bumbu ruja or whatever, you know. They'll be carrying some everyday stuff, right? They're not bringing weapons, and I would guess, it's just my guess, okay, I would guess, maybe even Egypt, okay, you can go out, but please don't bring weapons, you know, we don't want you to attack us back, you know, so uh, these are just, you know, refugees, normal guy, normal people, not trained army, or at least not yet, and so at that point, Joshua was given the task, two tasks, number one, choose <laughs> Which one from these papa, papa, susu, susu, you know, all of these guys, I would imagine, guys and young guys, which one they can go to battle? Which one you can inspire them and to fight? To fight. Now, some of us might say to Moses, Moses, kok repot banget ya? Yeah. Moses, why, Moses, why did you do that? Why did you ask Joshua to go out to battlefield? I mean, you, 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 you are tight with God, right? You are close with Yahweh. I mean, God has plagues. I mean, just use the plagues again, you know? Maybe this time you combine plague number one, three, five, six, or seven, you know? Maybe you come up with something new. You got frogs with hail, 
frogs with thunder. That's Pikachu. You know, I mean, you know, you just uh, you know, you bring something new. You know, just and then, then attack the people, right? You can do something new with the plagues. But no, perhaps Moses wanted to develop Joshua. And notice again, Joshua was the one who chose the troops, not Aaron, not Hur, even though uh, they were the senior leaders. It's like, Joshua, you go. You pick these guys. Because you need to be prepared for what's coming next. Because maybe Moses know, next step is the promised land. And in the promised land, they need warrior. It's like God is shaping them. And that's how God is shaping us too. God doesn't just know the goal. He gives us the right the way to grow as well. For, let me just uh, give you an illustration. Does anybody know the cartoon called TMNT? Teenage Mutant <laughs> Ninja <laughs> Turtles. Tau ya? Tau gak? Kau kan ninja tau ya? I was, like, I was looking at the Gen Zs and Gen, uh, the Gen Alphas here. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's not ancient, it's classic comics. Yes, yes. It's classic cartoon, right? So you've got what? You've got four mutant turtles, right? You've got Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Donatello. Okay? Yang nggak tahu, it's pokoknya, they're just, you know, these turtles who bring weapons and fight bad guys. Okay? That's all you need to know. Now, there is a theory that each turtle is given specific weapon to train them about character. For instance, tahu ya ini lo, kau orang ninja ya, tinis ninja turtles ya. Rafael, Rafael, the red guy, he's the strongest. Root, aggressive. Tonjok dulu sebelum ngomong. <laughs> the guy is fist first. Very hot tempered. He wants to take over the group. He doesn't like Leonardo leading. Very hot tempered. And the weapon of choice given to him by Master Splinter. Twin size. Apa sih ini? Ini siapa ya? Karpu. Oh, bukan. <laughs> but Trisula. Tahu ya Bapak Ibu ya? And, and size, as AI, uh, by the way, is actually a defensive weapon. It's not an attacking weapon. To disarm opponent, not to kill opponent. As if to say, Raphael, you are the strongest, but you need to learn patience and peace. So, I give you size instead of machine gun or a sword. Because he knows, Master Splinter knows, that's what Raphael needs. Second, fan favorite, Michelangelo. Right? He is the most uh, scatterbrain. Apa ya? Uh, Kacau lah, maksudnya he's the most easy going, he, is, uh, he has lots of hobbies, he likes art, cooking, video games, skateboarding, comics. Basically the guy is easy going, the youngest of the group, yang paling bontot gitu ya, yang wah dia easily distracted. But he is the most talented, the most talented. I think one of the, in, the, in, the, in the comics he, be, he became later on the strongest. But anyway, he's the most talented, but he doesn't take his training seriously because he just like to play around. Bad concentration. And so, the weapon of choice, the nunchucks. You know, Bruce Lee's nunchucks. Why nunchucks? Because if you know, if you don't pay attention, nunchucks can hurt you. And, and uh, Tanto Osio was like, yes, yes, yes. Because <laughs> you know about martial arts, right? right. Nunchucks, you have to be, you have to, you have to be, uh, you have to be, to be focused. And so, Michelangelo, because he is such a scatterbrain, he was given nunchucks to train what? Focus. Discipline so that you can reach your pot potential. Not just defeat your enemy, but become a focused person. Keren ya? Donatello, the smartest, the brain, all about gadgets and technology. And then what, what, what weapon of choice is given? The staff, the bow staff. Ancient weapon, simple weapon to teach them about what? To teach him about what? That sometimes... Innovation also comes from learning to solve problems with what's available instead of learning, instead of relying on technology and gadgets. That's what he's trying to teach Donatello. And finally, the leader, the most iconic, Leonardo. He's the leader. He is the most level-headed, very mature, 
but also very moral. He's, apa ya? He's a he's a he's a compassionate guy. He doesn't like to hurt people unless it's important. And for that kind of person, he's given the most little weapon in Ninja Turtles, the twin katanas. Why? To teach him that sometimes you have to make hard choices to protect the people that you love. Keren ya? So every weapon of choice fits with each turtle problem. They are not just given weapon to defeat the enemy because the most important is not just to defeat the enemy but who you are in becoming. And so is, it is with, as we go into our discipleship, as we, as we grow into maturity in Christ. Basically, so I want to say, behind every challenge lies an opportunity to grow into Christ like this. And God knows best how to shape us. He knows best. Sometimes, there are times in our lives when God will say, and this is what He said to Joshua too, okay, I'm going to do it all. Just march around the city, play your musical instrument, and the walls will come down, right? Yeah, miracles happen too, like that. Do nothing, circle around, miracle happen. But there are times when God says to us, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it through you. You have to get up and fight. And so church, let's take a stock about uh, our uh, discipleship journey at this moment. Where are we? Have we seen every challenge, every hurdles, every struggles as opportunity to grow? And can we see uh, our fellow maybe friends or family members or church friends? Can we help them to grow as well? despite the challenges that they are having at the moment. Let's continue. So his, this is the battle. Like I said before, seems to be like an unequal battle, right? The Amalekites were seasoned warriors with well-used weapons. The Israelites were, well, recently liberated slaves with no experiences in warfare and few resources. So, meaning that they needed not just courage, they needed not just strategy, they needed God. Plain and simple. Kayak gimana caranya? How can you defeat the best of the best and you are not no one? Gitu ya. That's why as Joshua went to war, Moses and the other leaders, they were right behind him. Joshua went to the war in the valley, so to speak. But Moses, Aaron, and Hur, they went to fight on top of the hill. Each have their own roles. Now Aaron, you know, is Moses' brother, co-leader of the Israelite Exodus. Hur is mentioned here for the first time. Um, one historian identified him as the husband of Miriam, which makes Hur the brother-in-law of Moses. Don't know if that's actually true, but, the, but what's, what we know is Hur was once appointed as interim judge when Moses was absent in Exodus 24. Meaning, both of these guys basically are uh, leadership figures. Lah. The old guards. Moses, Aaron, Hur. And, and Joshua was the young guy, up-and-coming leader. Okay? Now, traditional military strategy will tend to put all the emphasis on Joshua and the army. But here, we see how the battle rise and fall on one important factor the staff of God. When Moses' staff is raised up, Israel prevails. When the staff is lowered, Israel loses ground. And please don't think, wow, what a magical staff. Where can I buy that? This is not Harry Potter, okay? <laughs> the staff is not magic. Rather, it's a symbol of the power of God. And so here we are reminded again that discipleship journey means we wholly depend on the Lord. We wholly depend on God in making disciples, in growing into disciples. Now, um, I think it's quite interesting the way they distribute the job, this, the, the job, the role, okay? Um, on top of the hill, Moses, Aaron, and Hur, and then on the battlefield is Joshua and the Israelite army. 
I mean, if you think about it, from the point of view of war strategy, understanding about people, Moses would have the advantage. I mean, the guy was raised in an Egyptian palace, right? Meaning, he would know the strategies of Egyptian army. The guy must be trained to fight Moses, right? He is older. He is more uh, uh, experienced, right? Um, and I, he was 80 years old here, but I think in that time, 80 years old, they can still go to war. Why do I say that? Because Caleb in Joshua 14.10 he was 85 years old when he, was, he, when he went to battle. Okay, so 80 years old is, he, Moses can still go at it. Moses can still wage war on it by himself. And do you remember, Moses ended his life and he was 120 years old. And this is what the Bible said about him when he died. His eye was undimmed and his figure unabated. Maksudnya, kekuatannya belum hilang, matanya belum kabur. So the guy was strong. The guy can take on enemies. But, but somehow, Moses said, no, Joshua, you go to war on the battlefield. I'll go to the other war. This is my role now. I'm going to pray to God, basically. Right? I'm going to do the spiritual battle, so to speak. You do the physical battle down there with the troops. Both are important. The victory came about from both hands. The hands of Moses and the leaders and the hands of Joshua and the Israelite army. Victory came from God through all of them working together in a powerfully unified fashion. And that's teaching us something today about the body of Christ, right? All of us here is important. The ministry up on the stage is not more important than the, mis the ministry behind the stage or in front as ushers, for instance. Semuanya penting, Bapak Ibu. Semuanya punya peranan. We are all in this together. We have our own roles. And please don't underestimate what God can do through you. I remember uh, listening to this uh, story by a pastor, a, 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 a pastor friend. He, he, was, um, uh, he has been into this Bible study with young people, and then he was involved. Uh, one day, they had a kaka air, right? They have a revival. And then the pastor, they can, he can't make it because I think he was sick or something. But basically, he was unavailable. Uh, Emergency-related issues. I forgot what he said, but it was a small kaka air, young people. I think just, I don't know, no, no more than, like, I think about 30 or something, but not those big, big revival, okay? Young people, Indonesian, by the way, Indonesian, in, in the U.S. And so, uh, this pastor, my friend, um, he was 19 years old at that time. And so, the speaker, the preacher, cannot come. <laughs> and then, so he was looking for his other senior, kakak rohaninya, you know. How about you? How about you? Nobody can do it. Like, like nobody can do it. And then finally, desperate situation calls for desperate measures. Again, this is back in the 90s, so they still have cassette. Tahu nggak cassette ya? And you know cassettes like what is it? Yeah, yeah, cassette yeah, cassette tape, cassette tape. Okay, so the, the pastor gave my friend a cassette tape of his sermon. I think the title was "The Finished Work of Christ" or something like that. Okay, and then he told. Uh, uh, the pastor, my, my friend, uh, where he's, he's older than me, but he said, you know what? Please don't do this, but this is emergency. Listen to the sermon, write it out, and then you preach it. <laughs> so you get the point, yeah? So listen to the cassette, this his pastor preaching, right? You write it, and then you preach it to the KKR. He was like, Oleh tak, boleh tak. Please don't uh, don't copy this, yeah. Especially if you are studying theology and <laughs> preaching. But that's for situation, and he's he's not he's, he's a 19 year old untrained, just ordinary student. Nobody can replace at that time, so he did. He was reading through the sermon, reading through the sermon, not preaching. Okay, it's different things. Reading the sermon, and then. 
he finished in 12 minutes. <laughs> and then he, and he wanted to pray. And suddenly he, 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 was, he was like, uh, I don't know what, the, what next, what next? And someone signaled, pray, pray, pray. Okay, I pray. <laughs> okay, what next? Okay, okay, okay. So ask for decision, right? Ask for decisions. And he asked, who wants to accept Jesus? Two hands. Uh, uh, pointed up. And then he prayed for them. After the KKR, he approached these two guys. Really? Did you, did you just really accept God? Jesus is your God? Yes. Yes. And he came from a non-Christian background. And then he told this, and then my, this, and then my friend continued to tell. And that guy, uh, now the guy who raised his hand, coming from a non-Christian background, got saved through a sermon, a <laughs> reading of the sermon by a 19-year-old, is now a pastor. By the way, this is a story from Komaike, Komaike Christian. So, um, uh, it's like, wow, okay, so a 19-year-old, Knowing nothing, in a way. And God can use that. As, as a, I'm not saying that, hey, don't, don't study the Bible. Just because, No, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is, we each have our own roles. Don't underestimate who you are. And if you look, if you see people and they are, they are, they are in need of help, please help them. A system like Aaron and Hur. I don't know if Moses said, hey, brother, I'm tired, please help me. I don't know if he said that. Or Aaron and Hur just, come on, come on, come on, Hur, we're going to support uh, uh, Moses now. I think that's probably the case, you know. So let's help out each other. Let's support each other. Let's be there for one another. Let's be successful together. Finally, the aftermath. The end of the battle, what, it, what, what, what happens. Verse 14, then the Lord says to Moses, finally, during this event, the Lord is not, is not mentioned explicitly. But here, the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner. Uh, it has to do with warfare image, that God is the one who brings victory, basically saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. For the first time in the story, God speaks. And God tells Moses to write something and to say something, right? To make a memorial. And then Moses also uh, built an altar to commemorate. This is where God is faithful. He brings victory. But the second thing is interesting. The Lord said to Moses, Moses, recite it in the ears of Joshua. In the Hebrew text, more uh, uh, graphically, it says, set it in the ears of Joshua. Set it in the ears of Joshua. As if to say, tell this news to Joshua and Joshua only. Not Aaron, not Hur, not the rest of the people. Tell it to Joshua that Amalek, today we beat them. But there will be going to be future battles with the Amalekites. Right? Uh, like, like what verse 16 ends. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And it's true. Joshua had wars with the Amalekites in his time. And implicit, I think, in this is basically uh, the Lord wants Joshua to be ready. That there's going to be future battles. That's why we need to prepare you now for what's coming ahead. And it's true, the Amalekites will harass the Israelites for long years and um, Joshua himself had no opportunity to decimate Amalek during his, life, during his lifetime, but he did leave the task to his successors, Saul and David. King David actually finished the job to kind of destroy the Amalekites. This final point basically is saying to us that God, uh, the, the lesson of discipleship that we are given here is that 
with new challenges, we need to prepare people. We need to prepare new leaders. As if to say, each generation has its own adversity. Yet God has been ready with a fresh batch of grace. God has been ready. Dave mentioned in the beginning that we had very distressing, distressing news, right? That's the challenge that we have for young people. Suicides, mental health issues. What works in the past might not work today. Maybe in the past, we just need a good sermon. Maybe now, five years, ten years, we don't just need a good sermon. We need a good sermon, a good pastor, a good people, a good... I don't know what else. You know what I'm saying? Like every generation will be different. That's why we disciple people. We want to create new leaders. That's why here in REC, we are, ve- we are, we are intentional. Come on. MSK, DG, CAMCAP. Let's rise up. I know that some of you ah, cannot be leaders. I know I cannot be leaders too. But that's why here, that's why God is saying, I, I, I'm, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm the one who waged the war with you. Right? Um, God, God, God is faithful yesterday, today. And tomorrow, always, the same God who has been faithful yesterday will be faithful today, tomorrow, and always. He'll be with us throughout. See, um, I am I am grateful. One of the, besides our discipleship journey, right? Uh, Red GM, for instance. Do you know that every fifth Sunday they have an intergenerational worship, right? So every fifth Sunday, they will invite all the kids to go up here, right? And just sing together, all the Sunday school kids. And then before, during sermon, the preacher will preach to the kids first. And then after that, they are let go into their school. Just to, to make sure that we are in this together. We, when we worship, we don't separate. The kids are welcome in the worship space. Very nice. Now, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't preached to kids in a long time, but there will be, there will, there will be. I hope that I can bless them someday. You know, preaching at the intergenerational worship service at the fifth Sunday. Takut si? <laughs> I'm scared and honestly a bit scared to preach with four little kids. That's why all you Sunday school teachers, you are our heroes, <laughs> right? Uh, and another thing I want to share related to this. When you walk in the church this morning, you might notice something a bit different. I don't know if you noticed that, but somehow we have a bigger space downstairs because we get rid of the tables when you get in the, get in the uh, front door. Um, we, we, we are praying and we have decided that we want to start youth fellowship. So we want to start maybe next week. We want to start next week. And, and downstairs, we have provided an area, a temporary area for the youth. And I... I'm grateful to God that God has raised up leaders to want to be an inspiration to teach the youth in this place. English Teen Fellowship, yeah, maksudnya uh, Teen Fellowship. I'm sorry, just to clarify, Teen Fellowship. So SMP, SMA, maybe until 20 years old. Um, and so, yeah, we start small. As you know, our church doesn't have a lot of space unless God gifted us with a large amount of money and we buy an next door or something like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but it's a start. Okay, so ini sekalian pengumuman ya, another announcement. So next Sunday, so I want to invite all the uh, teens. Next Sunday, you will have your own fellowship. You're not going to be here. But thank you, by the way, for attending and listening to me. I know sometimes it's not easy, right? <laughs> I use big words, right? I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience and understanding. But next Sunday, you will have a different, better uh, speaker than me. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm just, I just announced that and I'll give you more details. I don't think we can have Teens Fellowship every Sunday for now, but the point is, this is our commitment and I, I, I want to ask your support, your prayer, your, uh, you know, just think about, hey, maybe I can help with this, you know, because like we said, you know, we want to build, we want to build the next generation. We want to build uh, uh, the next batch of leaders because we don't know what's going to be happen, happening tomorrow in 10 years, in 5 years. That's why I said last Sunday, part of it, that's why I want to go to study again. You know? Because I don't know how preaching will in, 
evolve in the next five, ten years. Can you? I would imagine maybe one day a hologram preacher will replace me, you know, and using AI to preach with you guys. And and then what is the? Can can I still preach in te- five, ten years? You know, maybe you just have a hologram of John Calvin or a hologram of Augustine or, or whoever, like yeah, who have a hologram of your favorite preachers, and you know, and then we don't need life preacher anymore. So I need, I need, I, I want to upgrade myself too, you know, because of what's coming ahead. But we are thankful that God is faithful. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, and always. God is faithful even when we are not faithful. God is faithful even though we like to stray away from Him. And do you know why that is? Because in Jesus Christ, we have the greatest warrior. In Jesus Christ, we have the Son of God who has come and did destroy the works of the devil. Joshua and Moses win physical battles one time, a few times, repeatedly. But Jesus won the ultimate battle against the power of sin, the power of death, and the power of the devil. One time, he disarmed authorities. See, the devil is not pleased when we focus on being disciples. The devil is not pleased when we make disciples. But Christ will be triumphant, and we will be triumphant because Jesus has defeated the greatest battle that we need to overcome. And so I want to close with a song. I'm not going to sing the song. I don't know how to sing it. But somehow it just appeared in the fi- and in the last two or three weeks. This is City Alight. And the, the song is called The Battle and the Blessing. I'm just going to read to you some of the verses as we close. We did not bear the wounds that freed us or walk the road to Calvary. We did not share your cup of suffering, and yet we share your victory. We did not wear that heavy burden, nor face the shame and agony. A crown of thorns was placed upon you. Now we are crowned with love and peace. Yes, the battle was yours, and the blessing is mine. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you have won the greatest battle for us. We are helpless, rebellious sinners, destroyed and tossed here about by, by life, by difficulties and sufferings. And yet you came to overcome the power of darkness, transferred us out of that kingdom into the kingdom of light. You have won the battle for us. So now we can join you We can join you to bring healing and restoration to places, to people's hearts that are still broken down and tired. Lord, thank you for the privilege of coming to you and to know that you are always faithful to us. Help us to respond to today's sermon as well, to continue the process of being disciples and making disciples to prepare the next generation, to support the young generation, to love to serve the young people, the young leaders, the young uh, elders, uh, people that are around us. Help us, Lord, together so that we can win many, many battles with you, whether battles in our personal life, our family life, or our congregational or our uh, church life here. Thank you, Father. This is our prayer. We lift them up in Jesus' name. Amen.